Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Kathy Kennett with PPMD, and I'm joined by Dr. Robert Benjamin, who I will present today's um, webinar on puberty in Duchenne. So as a way of introduction, Dr. Benjamin did his undergraduate work at Harvard and attended medical school at the Univer or Medical School of Georgia. He then did his pediatric residency at the University of Wisconsin, followed by a pediatric endocrinology residency at UNC. He's been at Duke University with pediatric endocrinology since 2006. In addition to serving as medical director with Lennox Baker Hospital, uh, clinical director of pediatric diabetes program at Duke and associate, associate program director at the Duke Pediatric Residency, he's also a clinician specializing in pediatric endocrine disorders, so he's a very busy guy. He has been the point person for endocrine and the management of boys with Duchenne coming to Duke for their care and closely works with the neuromuscular team, so we're very happy to have him. As a way of housekeeping, just for two seconds, uh, I, you all are muted. If you have questions, please put them in the box in the lower left-hand corner, and uh, we will ask them either at the end or during the session as needed. Um, and thank you again for joining us. Dr. Benjamin? Uh, thank you, Kathy, and uh, thank you, PPMD, for inviting me to speak briefly to you all today about puberty uh, and also puberty in Duchenne. I have had the um, the pleasure, as Kathy mentioned, of, of working with our neuromuscular group here, Dr. Smith and colleagues, um, over the past five to ten years and uh, have um, gotten to know a lot of great, great families and, and had many discussions about puberty, normal tempo, and, and what to expect uh, and when to intervene. With that in mind, I thought today I would discuss normal puberty in boys. We'll briefly define it and talk about when it happens, how long it lasts, and what kind of growth uh, is usually expected during this time. We'll briefly touch on delayed puberty and what it means, and then we'll relate this to Duchenne um, and talk about the likely causes for delayed puberty, uh, and then maybe even most importantly, interventions and treatments. Throughout this, I'll make some important points that I hope you take home, and I've just highlighted five of them. Uh, you know, as I go, if you have questions or something isn't clear, please reach out and ask a question. I, I uh, would love to explain points uh, more clearly if there's anything that doesn't come off uh, well. Puberty can be defined as a transition from sexual immaturity to maturity. It is a massive time of change, uh, and this is cognitive, psychosocial, and physical. The physical changes are really marked and significant. We see dramatic changes in growth, body composition, eventual fertility, brain development, cardiovascular functioning, and bone mineralization. There are some terms that you may hear in your uh, provider clinics or online that I thought would be really important to define because some of them can be confused for pubertal terms or, or could imply puberty when, when puberty actually hasn't started. So I thought it would be helpful to outline those terms briefly. Adrenarchy is the activation of the adrenal cortex. The adrenal glands sit on top of your kidneys and they play vital roles in maintaining blood pressure, maintaining blood sugar, and also providing a stream of androgens, which are, um, for better, you know, lack of a better term, male hormones that can lead to a lot of physical changes that look pubertal without actual puberty. Gonadarchy would be the activation of the gonads or the testicles. Pubarchy would be the presence of pubic hair. And spermarchy would be the age at first ejaculation. What happens in puberty? Now, the hypothalamus is the main control center 
of the pituitary gland in the brain. It, it regulates many other functions as well, but for the for our endocrine focus, we'll just talk about its effects on the pituitary gland. And it sends out a hormone, GnRH, or gonadotropin-releasing hormone, that goes to the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland is a really busy gland. We're going to focus on its uh, function in puberty, which is to send message down to the gonads, in this case the testicles, and those messages can be abbreviated as LH and FSH. These are called gonadotropins. What does this mean? Well, gonad would be testicle. Tropin is uh, to make bigger. And so the, this message from the pituitary gland goes to the testicles. The testicles respond by making testosterone. And that's a simplified uh, diagram and also leaves off one of the other things that can happen dependently on testosterone, but also independently of testosterone, and that is sperm production. The pituitary, as I said, though, is a very busy and important gland and, and has several other roles and functions. It makes growth hormone. It makes the hormone that controls the thyroid. It makes the hormone that controls the adrenal glands, and it also makes a water hormone. But for the purposes of today's discussion, we'll just focus on the testosterone um, and its role with stimulating the testicles. So if we summarize then, in puberty, you get a message from the higher brain stem, the, the, I'm sorry, the higher brain hypothalamus, which then goes to the pituitary. The pituitary goes to the testicles. The testicles make testosterone. And testosterone has a lot of effects in the body. Some of these won't be a surprise to you, especially if you have children who, uh, boys have gone through puberty. Uh, one of the big ones is increased muscle bulk. Uh, strengthening bones and what we call bone mass accrual. Testosterone plays a vital role in this, um, especially in the teen and early uh, 20s. Testosterone can cause coarsening of the vocal cords, which leads to the deeper voice you might hear as puberty starts, and also gives rise to some of the sexual changes you might notice um, or you may hear about uh, from your child, including um, penile enlargement and widening, uh, pubic hair, um, thinning of the scrotum, and uh, and then eventual increase in size of the scrotum. Testosterone also plays uh, an important role internally in the uh, boy's development and leads to uh, some of the important uh, um, development of internal reproductive structures as well. But don't think that testosterone does this by itself. In fact, uh, many of the effects of testosterone are mediated through its conversion to estrogen. Estradiol is the main estrogen form produced in boys and girls. And both boys and girls make both of these hormones. They make testosterone and estrogen. The difference is that usually girls make much higher estrogen or estradiol levels, and boys make much higher testosterone levels than girls. Estrogen has many roles in the boy's body as well, and is probably the primary hormone involved in the growth spurt that you see with puberty. It also plays a very important role in bone mass accrual, and so thickening your bones and uh, to make a stronger, healthy adult bone. It can have, uh, and, and it's probably the hormone actually that's involved in eventual growth plate closure. What this means is the um, end part of the long bones becomes mature, and eventually closes. And I'll show you an, an x-ray, which demonstrates this later. Um, and, you know, once this happens, there's no more linear growth, no more height that you can gain. So it's really estrogen and not testosterone that leads to the major growth spurts and growth plate closure. 
Oh, I should mention um, the the one j- directly above it, which is the gynecomastia. That means male breast development. And this is a really common thing that we see in boys as they undergo puberty, as testosterone is still in lower levels um, as it's being produced by the gonad. It converts a portion of this to estrogen, and estrogen stimulates male breast tissue in the same way that it would stimulate female breast tissue. So I have boys who come in to clinic concerned because they've noticed some breast soreness or embarrassing breast enlargement as puberty begins, and this is a common and normal effect of early puberty and estrogen production. I jumped, I'm going to just show you again, um, these bold, dark um, uh, bullet points are meant to show inhibition or blocking. Estrogen feeds back on the brain and inhibits how much more puberty hormone you make. So it plays a role not only in helping you grow, but helps keep your testosterone and your brain hormone levels in check. We call this feedback inhibition. It feeds back on the brain and keeps those levels in check. So take-home point number one would be that estradiol, that's made mostly by testosterone, leads to growth surging, growth plate closure, and is the main hormone involved in keeping puberty hormone levels in check in boys and girls. So we talked a little bit about puberty and, and uh, I'm sorry, about the, the axis and how um, testosterone is produced. Well, and what puberty is, so when does it start? There's a wide range. A normal range is anywhere from 9 to 14 years of age. The mean ages would be 10 years for Caucasian, 10 years for Hispanic patients, and 9 years for African American. This is also true in girls who, who have puberty a little bit earlier, but the difference between Caucasian, Hispanic, and African American patients, with African Americans typically developing a little bit earlier. There are many influences on pubertal timing, however. Genetics. Probably the strongest contributor for anything is your genetic makeup. If you have parents who developed early, you are much more likely to develop early. If you have parents who are late bloomers, you're much more likely to be a late bloomer. As we showed, ethnicity plays a role in when children develop. So overall, ages are pretty close. The environment in which you live, there have been a lot of concerns about environmental exposures and the impact those may have on early pubertal development. I can say that I think these concerns were most prominent maybe starting five or six years ago. And in very few instances did an environmental exposure lead to early puberty. There are some uh, medicines and topical uh, herbal supplements that we ask families to avoid, but um, so environmental exposure is probably low on that list. But environment can also mean living in a, a place like the United States where many families have an overabundance of food, and this impacts weight, which also then would impact pubertal development which is a tie-in directly with obesity. There's no question that children with obesity develop a little bit earlier than those who are uh, normal habitus. They don't usually end up taller, but they just get there faster. Health, and I tie in with health, medications can have dramatic impact on pubertal timing, and this is something that we'll come back to as we touch on puberty in Duchenne. What are the physical findings that we see in boys as they go through puberty? And this is really important because I think that, honestly, many pediatricians uh, who practice medicine aren't totally square on this this sequence. The 
And the, this is really the, the first key trick, which is pubic and axillary hair could reflect adrenarche. And remember that adrenarche means activation of the adrenal glands, but not true puberty. So oftentimes, as puberty is beginning, hair shows up. And, and with hair can be acne, body odor, um, you know, mustiness after exercise. But that is not puberty until testicular enlargement happens. So true central puberty starts when the testicles enlarge. And as I mentioned before, in early puberty, this can lead to some breast enlargement in boys. But also, I put in the breast enlargement just to emphasize that this would be the first sign in girls for true puberty beginning. I'd say that may be the most important take-home point of them all today, that puberty has not begun until that happens. And then spermarchy, which is, as we talked about, the age at first ejaculation, which implies normal uh, sperm production and uh, high levels of, high enough levels of brains, you know, those brain stimuli that we talked about, and also testosterone can play a role in this. So take-home point, which I've abbreviated as THP, number two, is that puberty starts in boys with testicular enlargement. <clears throat> we have tools in our clinic to help us assess where puberty is. And these, this picture you see here are, uh, are called uh, Prader beads, P-R-A-D-E-R beads. And most endocrinologists have a set of these. Why this is so helpful is there are a wide range of testicular sizes for different stages of puberty. And we have, we like many people have short-term memory. If we go in a room and examine a patient without a, a model or a standard, we tend to uh, misrepresent where we think puberty is. So uh, the, you can see on this chain, the lower numbers mean early and, you know, number one, two, and three is childhood. So that would be pre-puberty. That child is not started in a puberty. And then it can be a subtle difference as you go from testicular size three to testicular size four where puberty actually begins. And then from that point on, a progression in size all the way to adult size testicles. What about growth in puberty? Well, almost 20% of our adult height is achieved in puberty. This can be, on the average, 12 to 14 inches. So it's profound. This usually starts with the limbs and then moves to the trunk. So we, we hear people described as all hands and feet, uh, and, you know, really long arm span, and then all of a sudden their trunk catches up. What you may not know is that boys end up, on average, five inches taller than girls. And why this happens is boys develop later. This can be and another important point to remember because it can be traumatic for a boy to see his younger sister growing faster than he is and maybe even growing taller than he is. Uh, but this is a normal finding and just reflects that boys start later. Boys end up five inches taller because they grow, they, they have their pubertal start later, so you can think that they have pre-puberty for two extra years, but they also have a longer pubertal growth spurt and greater peak growth velocity than girls. The duration of puberty lasts approximately six years, so there is some variability here. So take home point number three, Boys, don't worry. You are supposed to have puberty later than girls by an average of two years. This um, picture can be confusing, and so I've tried to highlight the areas that I'd like you to um, focus on. But this shows a growth rate in boys. And you notice, notice the black, the dark black line. This would be an average growth rate. So what you can see 
if you trace the black line from age 3 down until age 12, is there's a gradual reduction in growth rate down to about the 5 centimeter roll. So the y-axis there are centimeters, and the x-axis is age in years. 5 centimeters is approximately 2 inches per year. And then there's a dramatic rise in growth rate up to almost 10 centimeters or 4 inches a year. So I've highlighted that here and here. Boys, on average, hit a peak growth rate of 10 centimeters per year, and they have puberty that goes from approximately age, uh, pubertal growth that goes approximately age 11 till age 17, thus lasting up six years. The other curves, the other colors, the blue one represents early puberty, and the orange one delayed puberty, and I'll come back to that. So here's a, an example of a growth chart of a healthy boy who's not on any medications. Uh, probably not someone who would need to be seen in the pediatric endocrine clinic at all, to tell you the truth. But what you notice is it's not a perfect line, but if we, if we connect the dots here, we get a line that's, that's going along the 90th percentile as it should be. And why would and also notice that age 12, there's an uptick in growth rate, 11 and 12, uh, that the line gets steeper as this boy goes through puberty. So I would think this young man has had normal growth and development, has started puberty at the normal time, and looks to be growing right where he should be. Genetics play a role in height prediction as well. And if we were to calculate out his parents' height, they, they would come out to average around six feet tall. Now, when I say average, I should mention that because boys are usually five inches taller than girls, we usually add five inches to mom's height before we average it with dad's height. So in this case, dad was six feet tall and mom was five seven. We added five inches to her height since boys are five inches or men are five inches taller and her male equivalent height is also 72 inches or six feet. So this boy is growing normally. But I also want you to realize that if you're growing on a lower position on the chart, it doesn't mean you're not healthy and it doesn't mean you're not growing where you are. This is a seven-year-old also followed in clinic and uh, with concerns about growth, but I'll draw an arrow in here to show where his parents would be, uh, right around 5'4", five, 5'5". Five, five. So he's actually growing normally. So growth positioning is not indicative of, of a growth problem. It's growth rate, which which uh, we pay attention to mostly. So growth is critically important during those puberty years. Now, what about bone development? This is also really important, and we talked about the effects of testosterone and estrogen on this. Bones develop in every dimension during puberty, in length, width, mineral content, which talks about calcium, and phosphorus, and also in thickness or density. As boys hit a growth spurt, oftentimes the length and width, I'm uh, sorry, the length predominates more than the width, the mineral content, and the density, and they can be at increased risk of fracture in early puberty. What about body composition? In, in boys, and this can be a contrast uh, from girls' development, the body composition in boys during puberty usually starts with a decrease in body fat. So you hear about people, you know, boys growing into their baby, uh, growing through their baby fat as they hit puberty. Uh, there's a marked increase in lean body next, but I should emphasize that this is lifestyle dependent. We, we talk a lot in our clinics about not assuming that your child will outgrow, uh, extra weight and making sure they have healthy dietary and exercise habits. Okay, so to summarize, puberty starts around age 10 to 11. Testicular enlargement is the first sign of true puberty. It lasts approximately six years. We talked about 12 to 14 inches of growth. Their peak growth occurs towards the end of puberty in boys and it's a crucial time for bones and body composition.
What about delayed puberty? How do we define it? This is also important because I hear from a lot of families and a lot of uh, parents of young men with Duchenne, is, it, is my child late? They, you know, they're, they, haven't, they don't seem to have any changes yet. Is it too late or is it late? If you don't have any gonad enlargement by 14, you're technically uh, described as having delayed puberty. And so if we look back at our growth rate, you can see this in orange, the orange line, that the growth rate declines, it continues to decline from age three, or you know, really, this, these lines really start at birth, by the way, but on the graph, they, they are showing them starting at three. And then there's an increase in growth velocity, which isn't quite as steep as the increase in growth velocity in children with normally timed puberty. But overall, because they grow almost two years later, the final height is usually not jeopardized, or adult height is not jeopardized. So they start later, they have less of a growth spurt, but they end up where they should be. This is a great example of a healthy boy who had delayed puberty. Notice his growth up until age 14. He was growing along the 25th percentile, downtrended with his growth a little bit from 12 to 14, and then had a market rise depicted here with the arrow when puberty started. And he had, therefore, delayed puberty. It hadn't started before 14, but without any intervention, he grew uh, back up to where we would expect him to be and where his parents' heights would predict. It can happen, and it's always scary to parents because they think, well, it's just not going to happen. I, I, my child hasn't gone through puberty and his friends have. What can we do? Usually, in a healthy boy who's not on medicine, there's no intervention needed. So the most common cause, then, of delayed puberty would be a familial pattern, genetic pattern of being a late bloomer. And we all can think of examples of young men or women in our high school classes who are the shortest at the time who at our five-year reunion are now the tallest. So we do see it uh, quite a bit, and usually those children maintain normal growth rates and just start everything a little bit later. There are other causes for delayed puberty. Secondary or central would be if the pituitary gland is being suppressed, and we'll come back to this. Um, this would be this could be due to the effect of medicines, and this is particularly pertinent in young men with Duchenne. Or if you have a primary problem within the testicle, which we would not expect to see in Duchenne. We'll come back to this. How do we investigate delayed puberty? We check the brain messages. Remember, that's LH and FSH that come from the pituitary gland. And we also check testosterone levels at age 14. These usually should be checked in the morning, but it, it they shouldn't, because that's when their peak values are, but they shouldn't go down exceedingly during the day. So I will check them even in the afternoon. I know, um, especially with, with families coming to neuromuscular, I'm sorry, multidisciplinary clinics, uh, come from long distances. It's not always possible to get here early in the morning. We should be able to tell, uh, you know, very well by that time. So if we were to be concerned, if we were to check those levels and find that the brain message was really high, the LH and the FSH was really high and the testosterone was really low, that may be a problem. And that could reflect that there's testicular damage depicted by this block here. And again, there are genetic causes for this. There can be uh, causes that are induced with uh, cancer treatments. But again, not something that we would expect to find in Duchenne. On the other hand, we could see low brain messages and low testosterone messages. And that, then we have to separate out whether we think this is um, a normal delay or influenced by medication. And this is often the, the trickiest question uh, in young men with Duchenne. Is this just delayed puberty or is it an effect of medication? In that case, the pituitary message is low, which also leads to low testosterone uh, and testicular involvement. 
This is where a bone age is sometimes helpful. What's a bone age? It's an x-ray of the hand. And what you can see from this um, is this is a, a young patient with a left hand film. What you notice are the bones of the fingers. And just before the bones of the fingers, you notice these dots that are look globular in nature. This would be a young patient who has young bones. What you're seeing there are bones, and the black around it is cartilage. This child has young bones and therefore has a lot of time left for growth. If I show you a more mature bone age now, you notice there are no globules. Everything is merged together, and all of a sudden, uh, you don't see any spaces between the ends of the fingers anymore or in the wrist. So this child would not have oh, young bones, would be more like a 16 or 17-year-old bone age. So when we get one of these x-rays, I compare it to a book of standards from 0 to 18 years of age, and it enables me to say, I think this patient has a bone age of X number of years. It is always good, always good to have younger bones if you're short and you're not growing well, because it means you have extra time to grow. So when to start testosterone supplementation in the workup? We start testosterone supplements often at 18, uh, sorry, 14 years of age if there's no puberty present. This is take home point number four. We may try to jumpstart puberty first, and this involves giving three months of low-dose testosterone and then reassessing in six months if anything has changed. The thought is that if we expose the body to testosterone, it will wake up the brain and get the brain used to the effects of testosterone so that when we stop giving it after three months, the brain will say, hey, I like that. I'm, I'm going to keep it going and jump into puberty. Some are saying, and I, and I think this will be a, a focus of future research, why wait till 14 in Duchenne? And, I'll, and I'll, like I said, I'll come back to this in one, uh, in a few slides. There are many different testosterone supplement forms. This all has to be by prescription, by the way, and it is uh, often it takes prior authorization um, approval through the insurance. So it can take a while to get it, and that's because uh, it's a controlled substance and not something, you know, to be taken without a prescription. I bolded the top two doses just to show you these are the ones that we use most often. Injections are usually given every two to four weeks. They can be painful, and the reason you only have to give them every two to four weeks is they get put in the muscle. That's what hurts with a shot is getting it in the muscle, and they're complex in oil, which led, it leads to delayed release. It's a thick um, substance that has delayed release, but the problem is it's not perfect. You get peaks usually of really higher levels right after you give the shot, and then valleys when you're due for the next dose, and young men often feel that. They feel tired, uh, cranky irritable when they're due for their next dose. Gel is probably what I use most of all because it's a daily medicine. There's no shot, and there's it's very steady delivery. You rub it in. Um, it's absorbed through the skin. It gives a more even uh, testosterone delivery without the peaks and valleys. But it is daily, which isn't convenient. It's messy, and you have to be really careful not to expose others in the family by uh, touching anyone anytime, uh, you know, after handling the gel, unless you've really washed your hands carefully. So we usually tell people to wear gloves with this. But there also are buckle forms. There's a scrotal patch, um, and there are non-scrotal patches. There have not been uh, pills that have shown to be effective without associated toxicity. So, uh, and then research is looking at longer-acting injections, which may be weekly or monthly, but they aren't fully developed. So what are the good in testosterone therapy? Well, as we mentioned, testosterone as, through conversion to estrogen helps with growth velocity. It makes boys develop the way they know their friends are, so the secondary sexual development can really improve. It can help with lean body mass. 
It also uh, has, you know, good effects and really important effects on the bone and also with self-esteem. Now, what are the bads? The reason we don't just empirically start people on testosterone is, well, for one, if we put young men on testosterone, it gets converted to estrogen, we can blunt their growth time. We can close their growth plates too early. But we also can block their body from doing it. So we're taking over their body's fertility axis, if you will, and that um, can lead to infertility. So if we look back at the diagram, we give testosterone. It gives these effects that we like. It gets converted to estrogen. Estrogen gives these effects that we like, except for the breast development. But then estrogen feeds back on the brain and on testosterone, and the net result is decreased sperm production and possible infertility. So we don't want to give testosterone long-term unless we're sure that the body can't do it. All right, so to summarize delayed puberty, usually we define this as at 14 years of age. There's a later growth spurt, which may be decreased. Usually um, healthy children or children who have suppression of their pituitary have low levels of the brain message and low testosterone. And testosterone replacement has good and bad effects. Now let's touch on Duchenne and, and puberty with testosterone. I don't need to tell anyone who's listening to this when it's diagnosed. You all live this and know it. Or when glucocorticoids are started and which one. You all know very well and have seen very well there can be a loss of ambulation with growth slowing, delayed puberty, weight gain, and decreased bone health. And you probably have seen this growth curve in your own child. What you see here is a young man with Duchenne on daily glucocorticoids who has a very different growth rate than the young men we looked at earlier. Compare the left side, healthy young man who had the delayed puberty, to the right side, the young man with Duchenne who's on corticosteroids. It's not a, um, a comparable growth response. So it's an important question to ask, you know, what can we be doing to help these young men with their, with their testosterone, with their growth? Uh, the pubertal delay is almost universal in those on high-dose corticosteroids. Contrast this to the general population where almost 50% of healthy boys have started puberty by 12 years of age. And you know better than I do that corticosteroids are often maintained and doses even increased as children get older to preserve muscle function. Glucocorticoids, which I've abbreviated GC, given chronically, are known to inhibit the brain's release of LH and FSH and to cause a central low gonad picture. They lead to delayed puberty and decreased bone health. So looking at our picture, we get no um, we don't get normal response from the pituitary to the message from the hypothalamus, and this leads to low testosterone and low levels, which can look just like normal delayed puberty, but is usually associated with poor growth as well. What about testosterone replacement in Duchenne? Well, we want to promote physical changes of puberty. We want to improve self-esteem. We want to improve muscle strengthening, growth velocity and bone health. Unfortunately, data thus far are limited. A search that I performed while getting this webinar ready showed only two reviews on PubMed search about uh, testosterone use in Duchenne. This was one in 2015 where um, investigators looked at testosterone treatment of pubertal delay in Duchenne. So over six years, and only 14 boys were uh, had intervention. The average age was 14 and a half years. All were on corticosteroids. Interestingly, an even split between inflaza and prednisone. And the total duration of testosterone treatment was three years, approximately. What they found is there was a dramatic improvement in growth rate from 
less than half a centimeter to year to three and a half centimeters per year, which is almost a seven-fold increase and an estimated height gain of almost 14 centimeters. Most were happy with the replacement. They felt like it massively helped. It was a major benefit and, and maybe improvement even with, with back pain. I'm very happy with it. But many were not. They felt that the shots were painful. They developed acne from testosterone, which is also a side effect, and they didn't get the kind of catch-up growth that they were hoping for. If we look back at the picture I showed you before of a young man with Duchenne on glucocorticoids, and you notice his growth rate, if I draw your attention to when he turned 16, this is where testosterone supplementation was started. And you can see that there is an improvement in growth rate, but that it's not nearly as dramatic as the improvement in growth rate we saw in the healthy young man who had puberty spontaneously but late. And I would say that it would be very difficult to gain 14 centimeters in height, or that's about seven, you know, six, um, six inches in height um, for this young man though it's still within the realm of possibility. We have uh, almost gained about four inches um, so far. So it absolutely helps. It does not restore growth rate back to what it would be without steroids. And lastly, a whole topic unto itself, and one that I talk to families about regularly with, is the effects of Duchenne on bones and, and puberty on bones. And that's we know that boys are at high risk for decreased bone density with muscle weakening and loss of ambulation, the high dose steroid use, and delayed puberty. If you look at the cross section of bone, without giving you molecular details, you can appreciate that a normal bone looks much thicker and ready to handle the stressors of movement and cares than the osteoporotic bone to the right which looks much more hollow and frail. And it's not surprising to any of you that young men with Duchenne often have fragility fractures and where, you know, subtle movements can lead to breaks and vertebral fractures or spine fractures, which are disabling and painful. Why do it, they happen? Well, we talked a little bit about the causes of um, immobility, uh, steroid use. There's also a disorder in calcium homeostasis, which just means that it's hard to keep calcium levels normal. Steroids also have detrimental effects on this and on vitamin D. We'll often check vitamin D and, and put young men on vitamin D replacement. And there's also inhibited bone formation and an increased breakdown. So you have an imbalance in how much you break your bones down compared to how much you form them. It's a fracture often waiting to happen. Long bone fractures are estimated in, in patients who are on corticosteroids in almost a quarter of all patients by age 12, and in almost 75% of young men after prolonged corticosteroid use can you find spine fractures or vertebral fractures. These can be subtle. Some patients have extreme pain and discomfort, but some don't appreciate when they have these uh, initial fractures until they've had a few, and they can be ha very hard to treat. What do we know about testosterone and bone health? We know testosterone improves bone quality through increasing muscle mass and, and reducing bone turnover, and then it requires conversion to estrogen. There are still, unfortunately, many barriers to pubertal management in Duchenne. And number one, it's, a, it's an awkward situation all the way around. You know, boys aren't particularly excited to talk about it. Uh, many providers aren't excited to broach the subject. It can be awkward to get a good exam. And I, I told you before, testicular enlargement is the first sign. We have to get a good pubertal exam, which can be really challenging uh, for young men in the chair. Also, with extra weight, this can cause uh, can cause um, the you know abdomen to push out, which can cause scrotum to push in. Can make it very hard and challenging to get a good testicular exam, which really needs to be with 
you know, close feeling and, and um, using beads. And, I, and as I said, an embarrassing topic. There are confusions about corticosteroids and, and which one is the best one for management of Duchenne, but also do they have differential effects on puberty? I will say my experience has been that there hasn't been a dramatic difference between the flasicord or prednisone and the impact on puberty. I feel they both suppress puberty equally. Venipuncture is difficult and painful. I would put that uh, in many in many uh, people's chart as a top barrier. However, in your young men who are incredibly brave and have been through an incredible amount, I would say they would many would gladly undergo this if there were uh, a good treatment option. And most importantly, lack of uh, data is our biggest barrier to puberty management in Duchenne. So take-home point number five would be that we need more DMD puberty studies if we are going to better ans answer the question about how to when to intervene with testosterone or other um, uh, pubertal medication and how to best do it. So to summarize the take-home points that I shared with you, estrogen is what leads to growth and the closure of the growth plates through conversion from testosterone. Testicular enlargement and not body odor or acne or hair is the first sign of puberty in boys. Puberty in boys starts two years after girls. Testosterone is usually started at 14 years of age in an attempt to jumpstart central puberty. And I put an asterisk by this because I am considering, strongly considering moving this age up in young men with Duchenne who have a known reason for that delay and, a, and a, uh, may have a benefit from early intervention, but most importantly, more studies are needed. That's what I have prepared. I'm, I'm happy to entertain uh, any questions. Thank, Rob, that was fabulous. Thank you so much for that presentation. It was really, really interesting. So we do have a couple of questions. One question centers around the impact of therapy with testosterone versus just stopping the steroids since those are the issue that, that's the main cause of delayed puberty. Can you speak to mm -hmm. the risks and benefits of both of those approaches? Sure. Um, this question does come up. Well, honestly, you know, steroids are, they are such a mixed blessing because they are so good in so many ways. They, they, uh, they have so many really beneficial medical uses. Um, and I think they've been very impactful in the management of Duchenne. They also have known side effects. And I think in any child, and any child I see, I ask the question, what I would do with my own child in this situation. And you have to ask the risks of not being on steroids and decline in muscle function and other health. Is that less than the benefit of, you know, improved growth rate, improved bone strength, improved pubertal progression? You know, I think every parent has to ask their provider that. I know personally, I, what I would hope would be instead of choosing A, stopping steroids, or, um, you know, and B, uh, starting testosterone, I would hope that option C would be a corticosteroid that doesn't have these effects on puberty and on growth and on the bones. So we'll have to wait for that to be developed. Yes. Hopefully in the future. Have you seen um, hypogonadism in uh, patients who have who have had Duchenne but have not been on steroids? And um, what what do you think might be the primary cause of that delay in puberty? Well, um, I haven't because you know we define because pu delayed puberty is defined um, you know by 14 years of age, and almost every young man I've seen in clinic, usually they get referred to me because they're approaching that age, and I can't remember an example of someone who's 
not been on a corticosteroid at that time. But if I were to see such a patient, I would first get a good family history. I would um, look at their growth rate. I would also look at that bone age I showed you because if I saw that the bones were very young, it might just be a late bloomer. Um, and if, if those angles didn't pan out, then I would, I would wonder just about the effect of stress, you know, um, and chronic illness because we know that patients with chronic illness will often have delayed puberty. But in that case, I, again, would expect the bones to be young and to show extra time for catch-up puberty and growth later. Okay. And I guess the rate of delayed puberty in normal population would be the same as the rate of delayed puberty in, in Duchenne, uh, exacerbated with steroids, obviously. But Yeah. And, and maybe chronic illness, too. I mean, that, that right. may play a role, too. If you, it depends on, you know, so how many... Providers have to see what's, um, what, how are the lungs, how are the heart. You know, those those will definitely play a role. And, and are they on any medicine, um, you know, through those other avenues that could um, could lead to uh, delayed puberty as well? Usually that would involve some kind of corticosteroid, though. Right. Okay. Um, is there any age or is there a, a, a maximum age that you can treat with? With testosterone, for example, if somebody reaches 18 and they still seem to be behind, can you still treat with testosterone at that time? Absolutely. Yeah. I, mean, I think the, the um, uh, in fact, the, some think that for bone effects, it's most important that testosterone levels are normal in the late teen, early 20s. Uh, and so, yes, I think um, that's absolutely possible and a good idea. I mean, and once uh, you know, you can continue on testosterone indefinitely if your body's not making it. What becomes challenging is to decide when do we want to when do we want to retest how much uh, the body can make. And usually, you need you would need almost a month off of medicine to let your body's uh, you know if you if you gave testosterone to anyone healthy or no, they'll shut off making testosterone themselves. So we have to en enable time for recovery. Um, by, by stopping the medicine well in advance of rechecking their internal levels. So you would put them on medicine. Can you sort of go through a scenario of, of how you would check? You did a little bit, but um, how you would start testosterone, when you would take them off, when you would recheck, and then if, it's, if they're not still producing testosterone, how long could a patient expect to be on uh, this, this uh, hormone? Um, well, so normally I'd start at 14. I would, I would, uh, I mean, historically, I would uh, give three months of testosterone um, supplementation and then see them at six months. If if nothing had changed at six months, there are times when we've tried it again. Um, I I usually have not done two trials of jump starting puberty in young men with Duchenne because the because we know so much the impact of the corticosteroids. I would put that young man usually on a gel, um, and and then um, I would say, uh, you know, follow up until uh, 18, 19, 20, and then and see how we've how the side effects have been, or have there been any um, side effects that are unpleasant. Um, we would look at bone health, and and you know, as you all probably know, there's some controversy. The best way to look at bone health. Uh, is it through x-rays or through density scanning? And then I would I'd re-examine, um, you know, what, how we were doing with the testosterone. I would probably give the patient a trial off um, by age 20 and see if they can make testosterone on their own. Okay. So it sounds like it's pretty individualized and that yes. method of treatment needs to be individualized as well. Yes. Um, because I would say that's usually true. the... I'm sorry. Because the moms are usually the person putting the gel on uh, yeah. the patient, not always, but um, and they obviously don't. We don't need testosterone. But um, is there? What are the precautions that the moms should take so that they don't run sure. the risk of absorbing them? Wear gloves. Um, I would just wear gloves when you do it. Get some some um, latex gloves if you if you don't have a, a issue with latex, and 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 then. Um, that's usually all you need. It shouldn't go through a uh, latex glove, certainly. Okay. Are there different testosterone variants? Uh, oh, sure. I mean, supplements? Yeah. 
And yes. are they tested, and how do you know? And um, you Well, <clears throat> let me go back to the – I can pull up the slide that shows the testosterone um, forms, <clears throat> and they're – I mean, the, the gels that have – that are prescribed there there I only have found two or three uh and but those have been tested and and are safe um I have not and, and in an injection there's only two forms that I know of and those have been tested and safe I have not prescribed the buckle uh form which you know would be uh something that would be easy to take and dissolve um in the mouth uh, and I haven't used the patches. The, uh, I've used a non-scrotal patch. It is effective, but it's irritating the skin and they fall off. So um, I would say, you know, there are the, the, the ones, the forms that you can get through your pharmacy have been tested almost assuredly. Okay. And I'm sure they all act a little bit differently, but it sounds like the, in, in the effect of those different variants hopefully will all be the same. Yes. Okay. Right. Um, so many clinics, many centers don't have an endocrinologist. So when should a person see an endocrinologist or start being followed by an endocrinologist? And when yeah. should they be evaluated uh, by bone age and for height and puberty? Sure. It sounds like 14, but maybe address that a little bit. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, uh, Kathy. Actually, I thought after I put the slides together that I should have mentioned uh, when to come and be seen. I I um <clears throat> I often touch base with families very early when they're here just to talk them through what I, uh, a time course. But honestly, in a seven-year-old, you know, young man who is fully ambulatory, uh, just starting on corticosteroids, um, there's not much need to see a pediatric endocrinologist. Uh, I would say usually by 12 um, it would be a good idea. It depends on the child, of course, the severity, um, how ambulatory they are, the, you know, and, and how long they've been on corticosteroids. But I would, it wouldn't be a bad idea within a few years of starting corticosteroids to meet with uh, an endocrinologist. Okay. There's an important point I should add to this, too, and that's also making sure, like, by, by putting somebody – we talked about how testosterone can block you from making testosterone. But if you put somebody on a steroid, you can block, you will block that person from being able to make a steroid. So it's important to have that conversation because we need our internal steroids to help us fight infections and other stressors. And so I would say, you know, it probably makes sense globally to see a pediatric endocrinologist within a year or two of starting corticosteroids. Okay, and to talk to them about stress dosing as well, yeah. make sure that you you know stress. how to um, bolster that steroid dose if you do need an extra dose, right? Absolutely, that's that's absolutely the point. And then hopefully that that person will give you a window of uh, follow up and when when to meet. But I in in that age, that first example I gave you, seven year old who's fully ambulatory, but maybe hasn't started corticosteroids. I don't need to see those that patient even probably for two years as long as they're doing well. Okay, that sounds that sounds really reasonable. And I had a question about if a patient is 17 and they start puberty at 15 and they're still very small, is there a possibility that they will grow more? And you said that puberty lasts about six years, so could yeah. you expect growth potentially for six years? Right. Uh, yes, if they have a delayed delayed puberty, their bones are 15. If we go and look, let me pull up a growth chart because um, I would say. You know, boys do slow down, um, start to slow down when their bones are 15, but there's still there's still a possibility of a few inches. Um, it just depends on, you know, the dose of steroid and, um, you know, if that patient, I would say that the chances are better that there'll be improvement or still some growth time with testosterone if, if puberty is delayed. Okay. And the last point is that uh, this testosterone is an, a medication or injection that has to go in the muscle. So there's no way that that medicine could be absorbed appropriately if it was given in a porticast, right? I don't know. From an injection standpoint, um, yeah. it doesn't have to go in the muscle, by the way. It, so it would possibly the, – the, the FDA approvals and, and the way it's usually been prescribed have been intramuscularly when you're using an injectable form. So 
we have um, one of my colleagues is one of the directors of the transgender clinic here. She's much more familiar with all the different uh, formulations and doses and administrations, and and they they've been using um, testosterone shots under the skin even subcutaneously. So it's possible that there would be other ways to deliver an injection, but I don't know the specific, specific uh, specifics of the question you asked. So maybe that's that's part of the further study needed. Yes, I would I think, but it, it may be out there already. Obviously, I just uh, it's nothing I'm aware of. Okay. Well, I think we're at the end of our hour, and I think I've asked all the questions, so I can't thank you enough, Rob. This has been fascinating and um, really important information, and we really appreciate you sharing it with us today. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for including me, and, um, you know, give people my contact information. If they have uh, personal questions, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to answer them. Absolutely. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, thank you. Is, yes, this concludes our webinar.